So welcome everyone to the inaugural Pearson Alumni Reunion Fest. And we thought it'd be amazing if we could kick it off with um, reconnecting with Pearson College, this beautiful, magical, transformational place that has influenced our lives in so many different ways and has been so enriching. And in reconnecting with the college, we thought it'd be amazing to you know, bring together the leaders in the college and, and, and connect with them directly. And so it's an honor to introduce Carlin Malloy to usher in um, the Pearson College Global Village Meeting. Carly is the Director of Advancement and External Relations of Pearson College UWC. She's now in her seventh year with the college and you know, she was born and raised in Victoria. She gets a lot of joy in bringing people to campus for the first time for a tour and to meet with students so they can experience the magic of Pearson, which is one of Victoria's hidden gems. So Carly, please take it away. Thank you, excuse me. Thank you so much, Annalisa. Before I get started, can everyone hear me okay? Great, and I'm just gonna ask everyone to mute. I can hear some background noise. I'm gonna actually, no, nope, I can't mute anybody. So I'll just, there we go, ask everyone to mute. I see there's also some comments in the chat, Annalisa. I'm just wondering if they need to be addressed before we get started about the max capacity. So just wanted to make sure you see that. That's wonderful. Uh, okay, well, welcome everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. You can probably see from the lighting here, it is seven o'clock in Victoria, BC, but I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here to introduce the Pearson College team. Thank you so much, Carly, George, Annalisa, and Ed for organizing this session. It's been a lot of fun hearing about the planning and seeing it all come together so quickly. And it's wonderful to be at a point where there's a hundred people and we're turning people away. So hopefully there's a way we can get more, but wonderful to see so many people engaged. Before I get started, I just wanna recognize that at Pearson College, we live, learn, and work on the unceded territory of the Shiano and Beecher Bay First Nation. And I'm calling from my home in Viewerall, Victoria, BC, on the uh, traditional territories of the Squamalt and Songhees First Nation. So this morning, we're gonna have a chance, or whatever time of day it is for you, we're gonna have a chance to hear from several people at the Pearson College team, It'd be Craig or Craig Davis, our head of college, Theron Shaw, our campaign director and PC16 alumnus, many of you know, uh, Jackie Terry Carroll, our senior philanthropic advisor who's been leading our class scholarship campaign, uh, Benoit Charlebois, PC9, alumni and community engagement director, and Brian Geary, our communications director. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of people and we only have an hour, but we promise to keep it short so that there's a lot of time for questions and conversation. Throughout the presentation, I'll just ask if you have questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll try to address them as we go. And if, if we, we don't have a chance to address them throughout the presentation, we'll do that at the end. And at the end, feel free to put your hand up as well and um, join in the conversation. So thank you all so much for being here. And with that, Craig, I'm gonna pass it right over to you to kick us off. Thank you, Carly. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> can I just extend my own um, gratitude and thanks for an amazing group of people I can see on screen and, and the full engagement we've got and the fact that we're turning people away or trying not to turn people away is a, is a fantastic testament to the organization of, of this event. It's, uh, it's fantastic, it means a lot. Um, as many of you know, um, we had a very challenging year last year, as many of you would have done in your respective contexts around the world with COVID. So seeing all of our students here on campus face to face, uh, as, long, as well as seeing everyone here engaged is, is, is hugely energizing for me and the team. So thank you, Carly, for that introduction and hello everyone, wherever you might be at different times of the day. Um, I, I've been given the the, the task of, of focusing on our strategy for this session, um, our st strategic ideas, our, our challenges, our priorities, and our outlook for the next five years. That's what I'm going to focus on. And as Carly says, please um, drop any questions you might have as I go through some of my notes on this. Um, and Carly will, will stop me if we need to address some of the questions in the chat because I won't necessarily be able to see those. But we will have time at the end as well. Um, and really, <clears throat> by way of introduction, we've been going through a process in the last 12 months of a strategic refresh. As many of you will know, we have a, a strategic plan in place, one that's on the website and uh, the documents there. It's entitled People, Place, Programs, Prosperity and Profile. And we decided that strategy is, is still very much 
in place, meaning we will, we will keep it there for the next five years. It's a very overarching strategy. And in many respects, we have not really driven through e each of those sections in the first five years. But what the um, initial consultation I had with the leadership team and with some faculty and staff on campus was that we decided we needed to drill down into the strengths that we have as a campus. And we wanted to focus, um, focus on what we do well, and therefore to make our targets a bit more concrete and a bit more specific. And therefore, from that, we have um, identified that we want to become the leading climate action and sustainability college, partnering with indigenous knowledge, and specifically partnering with three universities here on the island, one of which, Vancouver Island University, is led by the new president and alumni, Deb Sosia from Pearson College. So that's a fantastic serendipitous situation we've got. And that's really what we want to focus our education and programming on, but also in terms of sustainability, that is also going to be the focus for operations and engagement too. So as you can see, this vision is translated into our three strategic drivers. So you can see those on the screen. So place-based education, climate action and sustainability. Also reconciliation, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and of course, also our leadership skills, competencies and decision making in terms of what we're trying to develop in students. So as this is a focus and a refresh, um, it's not a full consultative process because we've really done that consultative process in terms of the existing strategy. Um, however, we have sought feedback and ideas <clears throat> already from some alumni groups. And I think it's really important that we capture feedback from this group, given there's so many people engaged today. So please do drop your thoughts and comments into the chat or pick up on any of the things that you hear this morning for, for feedback. Um, before we formally present this, this strategic refresh to the board in late November. I've already done this process with um, faculty and staff, uh, already done this with members of the leadership team, but we'll also be doing it with students too in the coming two weeks. So really what we're talking about in terms of the first element of place-based education, climate action and sustainability is um, in our five years, we're gonna to commit to this as our educational imperative our climate leadership development will be the focus for our student development. And as a campus, we're going to move towards, like many organizations, a, ne a net zero footing. Um, but the question I think that might or should come from all of the alum would be, how does this fit in with our UWC mission? How is it relevant to all of our students coming from 85 different countries? And how is it relevant for a diversity of profiles and interests and outcomes if we're focusing really much on place-based education climate action and sustainability. So what we've been thinking here, and I've been doing this work alongside other UWC heads across the movement and, and, and refining this pitch to them and you know, as really custodians of the overall UWC mission. And, and what I've been thinking, what we've been thinking is that Pearson's emphasis on climate action program, programming also prioritizes social justice and conflict resolution. The climate crisis is a global problem that requires diverse global solutions and just as the UWC movement was created in the post-World War II era to help prevent future global conflict, Pearson is now rising to the challenge of developing new leaders with the skill sets and mindsets to address our global ecological crisis. So with students living and learning together from over 80 countries with unique access to indigenous educators, leaders and approaches that we have here at Pearson, we are perfectly positioned to prepare emerging leaders for this role. And that's based upon the assumption that the, the scale of the climate crisis demands that we pursue solutions through many different impact routes. So that's through individuals as entrepreneurs and scientists, change makers in the, in the financial and resource sectors, leaders in technology and global health, and collaborators in the policy making private and public sectors. So we will not find our way out of the climate crisis with the same tools, approaches, politics, and jurisdictions that brought about this crisis. And as the most recent IPCC, International Pan Panel on Climate Change, seven year report indicates, immediate action is required that galvanizes diversity. So diversity of approach, diversity of skills, context and organizations, and above all else requires collaborative action. So from that context, the UWC movement and Pearson 
specifically is is perfectly situated to do this in terms of harnessing you know that, that amazing model we have of bringing students together from all over the world um, <clears throat> to think about maximizing that impact when they return to their jurisdictions in different contexts to, to work on something that needs to be addressed uh, in on a multifaceted approach so if we were to distill this thinking into a, a values proposition or a vision statement, what we were landing on here is a statement such as Pearson College is a global innovator in developing skilled climate action student leadership grounded in indigenous knowledge. We are increasing access and choice by offering multiple curriculum pathways, reflecting different student interests and skills, but focus on developing measurable social impact competencies tied to climate action and sustainability. So to be clear, focusing on climate action and sustainability is not a limiting or narrow agenda. IPCC reports identify global climate change as growing impact in all areas of life that magnify inequity, conflict, social injustice and well-being. Therefore, climate action leadership will intersect with global social justice, conflict resolution and intercultural dialogue. Equally, our impact work will involve economics, science, technology, language, aesthetics, philosophy, experiential learning, and university partnerships. It is an agenda that will engage many interests, contexts, personalities, and motivations. So whilst there will be a diversity of student interests and profiles, our climate action focus will refine our institutional social impact, advanced student leadership training, operational priorities, and philanthropy outreach. And in fact, we've done some work with our existing students around this to say, look, if this was something that was pitched to you, and by this we meaning that we are going to be proposing to launch a new parallel IB curriculum pathway alongside the IB diploma that many of you would have taken yourselves. And students were, you know, in the, the focus group we have were overwhelmingly supportive of that, the ones that we have on campus, just really as a test. Uh, and we will be pitching this to all of the national committees to, to say that in the future, if anyone is putting down Pearson as one of their priority UWC campuses, they will know that this a parallel pathway will be available to them as well as the traditional IB diploma. So this new climate action leadership diploma that we are working with the International Baccalaureate organiza Organization in getting authorized is also being um, constructed with our uh, university partners. So I just hosted a team of six people yesterday from Royal Roads, including President Dr. S uh, Philip Stinkamp and his four vice presidents uh, and Professor Robin Cox. And we are working with their incredible research unit in climate action adaptability. Uh, we're also partnering, as I mentioned before, with um, Deb Saussier, the president of Vancouver Island University, and Professor Ellen Kelsey from the University of Victoria too. So this new Climate Action Leadership Diploma is focused focus on a competencies model that many of you may have seen um, promoted recently by UNESCO and the OECD frameworks and mapping backwards from the UN sustainability goals. And it's, uh, it's one that's also shifting towards what we recognize in the educational sphere as a movement towards micro-credentialing in educational matriculation. So having a competency framework where students can uh, demonstrate a complex set of leadership skills and practical skills that uh, make them extremely attractive as future leaders in, in change leadership uh, and in what's being called climate adaptability, which is really going to be focusing on so many different spheres of life in both the private and public sectors. But this work will also benefit the students who choose to continue with the traditional IB diploma route, and that will still be the majority of our students, we believe. But it will actually wrap around their CAS and UWC and experiential work that they do that and you will have done yourselves. So it, would, it will pro provide a more concrete matriculation for the work that they do. And those students will also gain the benefit of the work we're doing um, for those people pursuing that parallel curriculum pathway. In addition to this, I'm, I'm leading the work across the movement for a UWC global diploma. So this is something that's been discussed and talked about for many years, and many people have contributed to that work here at Pearson um, before me. But what I'm doing now with the help of four or five heads is really trying to make the pitch with the international office in London and Berlin to get this global diploma over the line, properly resourced. And this will also um, provide a, an additional wraparound for this work 
so that our students graduate, whether they take our IB um, career uh, program, which is the Climate Action Leadership Diploma or the IB Diploma, they will also have the additional matriculation security of a UWC Global Diploma that will be, you know, will, will come with all of the benefits that UWC carries with it. Um, and the other exciting development that we were discussing yesterday with our partners at Royal Roads was using their climate change adaptation competency framework. It's an amazing document they're working with for graduate level students, but they will be adapting that for our purposes, for our students. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a sophisticated set of competencies that we are committing our students to develop in the, in the fields of climate action leadership, uh, planning and invitation, climate science and practice literacy, climate adaptation challenges and collaboration. It's uh, um, something that's an easily accessible document. If anyone's really interested in this, uh, I can give you the link to that so you can see the outcomes that our students will be moving towards. Uh, and I think in terms of finishing off in this piece of the strategy, I need to, I need to really emphasize the fact that this is an additive um, uh, strategy. It's something that will benefit all of our students it won't take anything away from our current programming and provision for the IB Diploma. Um, we need to make sure that this is something that is really seen as beneficial to all uh, and it will enhance everyone's route. Because we know that depending on the context that our students come from, that for many, the IB Diploma is the route they want to take. It's the one that's the most secure in terms of their needs. And therefore, that will be our resource commitment to that. This is something we are adding to our provision. And this is where our engagement with alumni and our partners comes in because there's something that needs to be resourced and financially supported as an additive stream. And it's something we're really excited by. Um, we also wanna make the modules of this Climate Action Leadership Diploma potentially available in a blended format on the UWC Global Campus, which is a platform which all students should be able to theoretically access from any campus. So we can offer this to all UWC students as well. And so that Pearson's you know, um, <clears throat> position as the leading campus in this particular field will be cemented because our work will be accessible to other students who don't have the privilege to access our routes into our university partners or our indigenous partners that we have here. Um, the last piece here before I hand over to the, to the team again is to connect these drivers to our specific financial and engagement pieces too. But also before that is looking at reconciliation, diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of this and how it fits in with well-being. Um, the other strand of development in terms of supporting our students and enhancing their experience here is really born out of, the, uh, of some of the challenges we faced last year. You know, during our COVID year, as they say, don't let a crisis go to waste, it magnified issues around well-being, as you can imagine when students were literally on campus, did not uh, return home during the winter break, were not able to leave campus and access those normal release valves of going into Victoria, going into a coffee shop, um, you know, in order to maintain that face-to-face -face learning experience, we had to keep them in that bubble. So that came at, at some cost, you know, because of course it magnified some of the challenges they have. So we learned from this. So what I, what I was very keen to do and went to the board with is saying, look, we are in a, an austerity budget context at the moment in terms of making sure that we're very fiscally responsible at the college, but we needed to release resources to enhance student wellbeing. So we added a position of a strategic wellbeing coordinator uh, and we put into place a significant training program that will move forward over the next five years to really upskill all of our faculty as advisors and so some of the training we went through this year was in trauma-informed pedagogy. Everyone's gone through a mental first aid training piece. Everyone's gone through um, training in, in um, anti-racism, implicit bias awareness and equity provision. Uh, and we have developed a brand new core course that students will take every week where they will engage with issues around character development and skill development and awareness uh, beyond the, the curriculum development of the IB Diploma. We've also, we're also going to double our counselling provision, including an online service that will be provided in 30 different languages, adding diversity to our counselling teams. And we're also you know, committed, and we've already implemented this in terms of our diversity commitment in HR, 
to ensuring that all new hires, that we are absolutely going to prioritize diversity hiring by ensuring that the that jobs are, are pitched in our refugee societies and tapping into all of the diversity contexts in Canada to reframe the question to say, you know, you know, if we hire anyone who isn't diverse, the question needs to be, why not? Did you exhaust every possible avenue to do that as part of our commitment towards DEI? Uh, and that partnership is also going to involve alum. We've already reached out to, to alum to ask if they will join our uh, DEI working group, including board members too, as well as our students, which leads me to the last piece, which is that the student element here, the other big strategic initiative that we're going to move towards is something we're calling our college assembly um, network of decision making. I spent quite a bit of time with my colleagues and with a group of students last year, putting a new constitution together, which we adapted from Mahindra United World College in India, and it places students at the center of all decision making. So from this year, we have just launched this college assembly model where there are student representation in um, seven different committees. So we have a, a committee that's gonna be working with the board, which includes two students, students working in an operations committee, an education committee, a student welfare committee uh, and wellness, an ethics committee, and also experiential educational provision committee. No decision that affects students can be made without their input and without their support, according to that college assembly model. So um, they're super excited by this. It's a, it's, it's a way of, uh, I'm hoping, um, bridging that gap between, you know, the impulse that our students have towards very positive social activism, but by putting them in the center of decision making, they will be accelerated in understanding the complexity and compromises that sometimes need to be made in that decision making certainly with financial implications. And um, we're hoping that that will really empower them as well in that, in that drive towards promoting their leadership skills. So as far as my piece is concerned, that's, that, that's, that's the end of that. But before I hand back over to the team, they will talk about the, the implications around finance operations and engagement. I think my final point of, point of question will be and concern around my around the strategy for the next five years is that it's very clear as a college that we need to create financial headroom as part of our strategy to do all of these things that we want to do to improve the provision and programming experience for our students. Our operating budget every year is extremely tight. The cost of maintaining a campus of this size in this location increases every year. And we don't have the economies of scale of other larger educational institutions, you know, drawing on exclusively from tuition revenue. As some of you will know, I, I came from a position as, as director of education in the large schools group in Southeast Asia. And when I think about the financial headroom many of those institutions have to better develop programs and facilities compared to our model, you know, it's a very challenging one. You know, we are committed to this UWC model of ensuring that we provide financial support at the same level every year and that's part of the unique piece of a UWC and why, why we've all come to work here. And that's absolutely what we want to guarantee. So we need um, ideas for creative revenue streams beyond our current modeling to be able to do the additional programming we want. So that's something that I'm extending out to the alumni group. Any ideas that you have, any support, thoughts are gratefully received in this adventure because um, we need to cost them and I want to continue doing this to, to ensure that Pearson is a leading institution, not just within the UWC movement, but across the globe. So back over to you, Carly, and the team to pick up on some of those threads. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Craig. I can see some really positive and encouraging feedback in the chat. I know that's how a lot of us echoes how we're feeling on campus as we're hearing about this and some of the early feedback we're getting from supporters and other alumni that we're speaking with. So this is great. Going to pass it over now to Theron to talk a little bit about uh, the campaign to renew and refound Pearson College. Thanks, thanks, Carly. Uh, it's nice to be here and see a lot of you this morning. I've had the chance to meet many of you over the last few years. I am a year 16 alum and uh, came back to, to this role with the college, bringing my, my career of philanthropy work to help in shaping uh, a campaign that, that's really designed to be the vehicle to support the kind of innovation that Craig is talking about. So what's going to, what does the college need for its next uh, several decades uh, of life. And 
So that campaign is well along and wanted to just give you all a, a really high level snapshot of it here. It's a $40 million campaign that we call a Renew and Refound campaign. And it has, you can think of it as a, a stool with three legs. It's got, uh, one, the first of those is the kind of work that Craig's been highlighting this morning around uh, what is going to be the Pearson College experience going forward, what, what's needed to really respond to what's happening in the world now and what are our students needing and asking for. Uh, the second of those legs of the stool, if you will, of course, is uh, scholarships and making sure that all of us as alumni uh, came on uh, this exceptional founding idea of scholarships for, for all or most of us. And so the board and our whole team is committed to keeping that as generous as, as we possibly can. So raising those scholarships will, will, I think, always be a priority for us. And then the third is, of course, the campus, the place that we've had some of the slides that we've, we've seen here this morning. I think all of us have that, that emotional tie to, to the physical place, to whether it's the views out from the flagpole or from the observatory or just the experiences we had on that campus. So, so the, the program innovation scholarships in the campus are what, what make up, in a sense, I, I just often describe it as everything we need to get done for the college over the next six or seven years. So we have raised uh, an amazing 25.7 million to date. Uh, and so that represents a, a great deal of progress in all those areas. Scholarships, of course, uh, we have the, the funds to initiate this climate action diploma. We're now in kind of a planning and design year uh, for the work that Craig was describing and expect to welcome our first students next fall. So that's a top priority for our fundraising. Similarly, the, our reconciliation work, our reconciliation action plan that many of you have probably seen from from past Global Village updates and from some of our e-news, that is also uh, supported through this campaign and is underway. Uh, we just finished, the students who arrived in August came to a brand new Victoria house, which is the fifth of and final student house renovation. So all the student residences it's, uh, have had a complete down to the bones renovation, which really is a milestone for the college that uh, those, those buildings that were built in a year, uh, in 1974, I can tell you that the contractors uh, scratched their heads a few times at uh, things that happened maybe a little too quickly in 1974 and, and somehow have managed to stand up all these years, but uh, they've now got seismic retrofitting and uh, the sprinkler systems and all the things they need to be up to code in 2021, as well as some just renovations to make them beautiful and, and welcoming for the students. So the dining hall will be our next big initiative for the campus and that'll probably be happening over the next uh, couple of years plus. Uh, those of us who remember the LLT uh, as a windowless dark space where we all watched CNN news and real to real movie projections and had choir rehearsals, uh, that space is really being reimagined and we've raised uh, some, some really generous funds to completely transform that space as an innovation lab and a collaboration space. And, so that's going to be uh, happening over the next year or so. I see some, some things happening in the chat that yes, all those student residences uh, have been renamed. And you know, as a fundraiser, I'll, I'll confess, renaming things sometimes makes you nervous. Like, oh no, what's gonna, some, somebody, somebody's gonna be upset, maybe lots of people. And this has been quite the opposite. Chief Chips from um, the Xi'anu First Nation gifted us uh, the names of the five different species of salmon and accompanying those a design uh, for each house that uh, comes from the Coast Salish tradition. And so we'll be uh, having something formal in October to sort of announce those and have a gathering with the Xi'anu First Nation folks. But I can, the students have been so embracing of that that it was just like days announced at the end of last uh, academic year and as a house parent I um, was helping all the students clean and pack for the end of the year and they were already writing uh, Kolak house instead of East house on their their things that they were storing over the summer so that people could um, could just claim that name out of the gate so I think everyone is quite excited about what that means in in spirit and fact on campus 
Um, on scholarships, I'll say one last thing, which is that uh, many of you have been involved in class year scholarships, and those are a way that all of us as alumni can lean into making sure that scholarships remain as generous as absolutely possible um, for, for people from around the world to, to come and be part of this global village. So it's a way that a class year can rally together. It's in my own class year. It's been a fun way just to reconnect with people and collaborate, do something together. Uh, and it has a spirit of paying it forward. So um, I think Jackie, Terry, Carol, my colleague is on this call as well. There are so many of us, it might be hard to find her little thumbnail image, but Jackie uh, will be hosting a session on Thursday about uh, how to launch a class scholarship. That's at 9 a.m. Pacific time, so you can edit it from there, but that's over this coming week, September 23rd. And we're working with quite a few class years and we're always looking to, to grow that. So if you if your class year is already active or you would just like to get involved in shaping something for your year, please let Jackie or Carly or I know any of us and we'd love to, to see what's possible there. Um, that is a way that we, as I, I'll just say again, as alumni, we can help make sure that the scholarship kind of foundation of Pearson um, remains as strong as possible. So I think I'll pause there. I'm happy to take questions as we go into that session, but I'll pass the baton here to my colleague Benoit, a year nine alum. For those of you who, if there's anyone on this call who hasn't met Benoit, <laughs> um, and I know Benoit wants to share some of just other ways that he's been working with PCA and lots of other alumni to make um, ties and links and threads and build community amongst our, our alumni circle and connect all of us more richly. So Benoit, over to you. Thank you, Theron. Um, not sure if you're seeing me because I'm sharing my screen, but in any case, um, I'll be very brief. Uh, never before have we had so many and so much offering, so many alum and so much offering uh, for alum to engage. Um, I mean, since five or six years ago, when years one, two, three, four came for the very first 40 year reunion on campus, we've been adding and adding and adding opportunities for our alum to engage um, meaningfully on campus, off campus. Um, we've had uh, new programs uh, or old programs revamped like Life After Pearson, which allows alum to come back on campus and to speak directly with um, students about their life journeys, to inspire them, to uh, mentor them, to coach them about what's um, out there in the real world. Uh, hundreds have come to the college for that purpose. Others have, um, for over three years, hun about 100 alum came to Alumni House on campus. Of course, with the pandemic, we've had to uh, put that on hold, but that is a program that will remain. Alumni for Life is a new program that we uh, put our newly graduated alum through one week post graduation, um, take them off campus and make them go through uh, what <laughs> simulation of what they can expect in the world at university or gap years. And for that purpose, we've invited many alum voices of all ages to come and guide um, the workshops and the sessions with them. Of course, we've had um, gatherings around the world for, for the as many years as we've had as we've had graduates, but now they've accelerated. There's um, even more online uh, gatherings uh, everywhere. And as you know, now with this concept, which I'm sure will become a, a tradition at Pearson College um, for the PCAA to launch this alumni and um, reunion fest is just uh, the embodiment uh, of what technology boosted kit rep type um, coming together, gathering of our cohorts, uh, will, will, will create an even greater network where people beyond their own cohorts will be able to connect with each other. And this is just a perfect image of that. Um, of course, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the 30 year reunion was an amazing uh, disappointment for years uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, who could not make it to campus this year but they turned it around. In three months, they created a 10 day long 40 sessions 
um, which made more alumni than ever before participate in a decade uh, anniversary reunion. 63% of the alum from those four cohorts were, particip were participants in this reunion. So there's great hope that uh, bringing technology together with campus and off-campus gatherings will generate that much more um, movement in our, um, in our network. And of course, the PCA will bring much greater focus to this. Um, so I'll leave it to that. Um, in, in the background right now is a virtual image of our campus. It happens to be uh, a place that we call Gather at PC. And it is a fascinating little um, addition to our uh, platforms for people to engage. And I will be inviting you on the 21st of September on UWC Day to come and uh, experience this Gather at PC. And um, I won't say more about it, but I'll welcome anyone who uh, will come on and you'll you will have received the invitation and we'll send a reminder next week. So thank you. Any questions, um, anyone? Back to you, Carly. Thanks so much, Benoit. I can see your background now of Gathertown. I couldn't see it before, but we can see your face and I can see that background. So that's wonderful. Before we move right into the q and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Brian, with the communications team. I know he has a few words to share. Over to you, Brian. Uh, thanks, Carly. And I, I will have a keep it to a very few words because I know that many people have questions. I'm uh, speaking to you this morning from my home in the traditional territory of the Saanich and Algonquin speaking peoples. I'm very happy to be here. I mean, it's so inspiring as a staff member of Pearson to see this kind of initiative from alumni across the years. Um, if, if there's been no other great outcome of the COVID period, it's been wonderful to see this kind of gathering that's been taking place online, this kind of fellowship. It is, it is amazing and it's humbling. I'm director of communication, so I'm responsible for the basic uh, communications outlets. So they're the obvious ones that you, you'll see. Um, if you go to the news and media section of our website and you look at the drop down menu there, you'll just get a sample of the kinds of things that we put together and that we share. Um, and interestingly, I've seen a number of questions about the uh, designs for the Salmon House. You just posted a story yesterday under the latest stories sub menu item. Um, it's actually a edited version of a letter that Emily Coolidge, uh, one of our deans, sent out to students. You'll see the images in there. You'll also see some of the, or be able to read some of the rationale behind those as well. Um, we're responsible for six social media uh, platforms right here. And Carly, I think, has shared the Flickr platform as well. Um, that's the photo based uh, library. So you can see, you can get a good sense of what life is like on campus by checking that out. You can also um, see what's happening on campus on our main social media feeds, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, those areas as well. And I, and I do urge you to drop in and take a look at those because they give you a sense of what is happening on, on campus. Um, we do do a, uh, something called Pearson E-News, our electronic newsletter. I don't know if all of you are subscribers, I hope so. Um, but in that, we've written a number of stories about many of the major themes that Craig has talked about this morning, including climate action, including diversity, equ equity, and inclusion, as well as reconciliation uh, as well. So again, I, I hope that you have a chance to look at those. What I would really say is that I would really like to hear from you, not just about what you think about what we're doing, but tell, tell us how you can engage with us. We'd like to hear more of your stories. We'd like to hear more of your thoughts about Pearson yesterday and today. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with me or my associate, Nicola Menda, and let us help tell your stories and let us help educate more people out there about the UWC movement and about Pearson College in, in particular. We, we have such richness of experience and um, stories out there that we, we're just, we're bursting at the seams with all of the, the stories that we have. So we'd love to try and tell more of those. I'm gonna hand it back to Carly because I know many of you have questions. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Great, thanks so much, Brian, and thanks for all of you. I will say we have less time for questions that we'd hoped because we have so much that we're working on that we're excited to talk about. So I hope that you all enjoyed what you heard. If we run out of time to answer all questions, please feel free to contact myself or any of us on the team 
following the session and we'll certainly be happy to answer those but for now I will open it up I think all of the questions that have come in the chat so far have been answered but you can either raise your hand pop it in the in the chat or you can unmute and jump in if you like Okay, I see we have our first question, Sibangile. I hope I said that right. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Carly. Having um, had this session and you've got a brilliant strategy, the question that I have is then, what is the fundraising strategy that underpins the um, Pearson strategy in terms of its focus areas, its priority areas, objectives, deliverables, and so on? Great question. Thanks so much. Aaron, do you want to take take that one? Sure, happy to. So the the campaign that I was sharing about Simonga, they really is our, our vehicle for all of this work. So we have uh, it, it's a whole vehicle to hold the, the climate action work, the reconciliation initiatives, scholarships, campus renewal, all that is is bundled in uh, a comprehensive campaign for this $40 million. And it's um, the fact that we're at that 25 plus million means we've, we've been raising the funds as we go to keep the, the work moving. So unlike some campaigns where you, you have to raise all the dollars to build X building and when we raise them, we'll break ground. Uh, this is much more of a, uh, what are we doing? What's our next top priority? Raise those funds for the coming year. Um, and so to keep the work is actually unfolding in real time as we secure those funds. So does that answer your question, Tibongale? Um, Theron, the, for me, is are there specific fundraising campaigns that you plan to implement? Or how is it that you're planning to, to raise? Is it just alumni or is it alumni and other uh, possible sources of funding um, that you possibly have access to? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So it's definitely alumni through the class scholarships work that I was mentioning. And then certainly we are looking at, um, we're looking at, we make applications to foundations across Canada and beyond. Those are probably the two strongest audiences for Pearson would be alumni and then foundations and corporate partners in Canada supporting Pearson as Canada's United World College. Uh, so those would be the two two audiences that are the, the, the core of this campaign, if you will. So and each of these initiatives has kind of its own strategy. Like we just had a three hour session yesterday with our team of combing through research we've done around funders for climate initiatives and prioritizing those and where we'll focus our, our next work. So each of the, the same thing would happen around the, a dining hall or a student residence. Each of those, we're looking at who would be the strongest possibilities for supporting that. Thanks, Theron. Thanks, Theron. Great. Pedro, over to you. Yeah, can either of you talk a little bit more about the endowment and where that's at and what the plan is regarding the endowment fund? Sure. Theron, do you want to talk about this as well? Sure. So the the endowment stands at about 41 million. So for those of us that have been around Pearson for some decades, we know it's it's had a long history. It's been built over the, the from the early days of the college. Uh, the endowment is in a, I've been in this role about four years and watched the endowment move into a more and more healthy role. So uh, we decreased the annual draw on the endowment each year because our goal was to get to a sustainable annual 4% draw on that. And we're at that place now. So that gives us a, a healthy, sustainable relationship with the existing endowment. Uh, gifts, there are gifts coming in through the campaign that are helping to grow that endowment as well. Uh, so that's, that's a priority of the board and of our team and uh, particularly around uh, legacy and estate giving is the that's the chance that most of us humans have to make the largest gift of our lifetime when we don't need our stuff anymore it's when we can give the most of it away um, so that's a place that we're particularly opening conversations around uh, longer term growth of the endowment and class class scholarship initiatives are 
also thinking about, okay, we're supporting a current student now, what would it look like to also endow our year 16, year 12, year whatever support on one of the folks from year 13, Remco, as a is working on a brilliant model that I think he'll be sharing more with some of us for if we if we as a class did half again so you do a scholarship and a half and put the half into an endowment fund over a period of 20 years say that let's hope that's the uh, that we're around at least another 20 years all of us uh, that would fully endow that scholarship so it's a there's different ideas like that but we're actively working to grow that endowment um, and I'll say one last thing on the numbers of that uh, the endowment does provide, of course, a stream of income from that 41 million, uh, we get 1.6-ish per year right now, and that will grow. Uh, to get to a place of suddenly full scholarships for everyone, uh, just I think it helps people to hear the number that that would take something like an infusion of 150 million plus to the endowment in addition to what's there. So. That's a great goal. It's a longer term goal, though. It's a it's a long game. We, we are working to grow the endowments, and when we get to that place, then we'll be able to endow everybody. But it's a uh, it is a long game to get to that. Carly, if I can just jump in just to add a few comments to Theron. <clears throat> um, we just recently had a a finance committee meeting where you know we we've gone through our annual audit with KPMG and. Um, and in that um, report, the the endowments actually grown to just shy of 50 million. So it's an incredible performance from the from the team that, of course, is majority of the team are alum. So they've done an amazing job in the last 18 months. Um, I'm no expert in the financial field, but I believe that there has been growth in the market. And I think they've but they've extended that growth way beyond the average. So it's a, it's a really fantastic um, performance there. And I think, yeah, I mean, I would just echo Theron's point around we have a commitment, um, a board approved commitment to grow that endowment. Um, because, of course, it's in the interest of the college to remain fiscally prudent, grow that endowment, because it's better for the long term future of the college. So the, the team that's currently doing that, our partners uh, are doing an outstanding job. And of course, they're committed because they're alum. So that's um, part of the beauty of having that kind of talent in our network. And Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I'm just going to send the next question your way as well. It's in the chat here from Ibrahim. It's talking about um, support for students as they're graduating. What support is in place when students are leaving at the end of their second year? Um, is there, yeah, what, what plans are in place there? You're on mute still, Craig. There you go. Yeah, I can take that one, Carly. I mean, thank you. Maybe what might, might be different from people's experience uh, in the past, you know, we've, we've added a resource here. So we have one full-time faculty member who doesn't teach who's now committed to supporting students not only for their university destinations but any destination they have post Pearson so it's in a significant additional resource because we've never had that I suppose luxury of someone who has no other responsibility other than focusing on uh, a Pearson second year students next steps um, and like I say that's not just for university that could be any number of pathways they choose to take so hopefully that will reassure you that that's now in place as an additional support. Thank you, Craig. Ehab, I see you have your hand up. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see the, uh, the focus on the diversity, equity and inclusion. How are we doing on, on the broader sense of the diversity, equity and inclusion from a student population standpoint? Kind of how, how diverse is, is the group getting uh, and how are we driving? for more diversity in, in its broader sense of the student population. Craig, you're just on mute. There we go. <laughs> Happy to take that again. Um, I didn't hear the first part. Um, if it was thinking about the maintaining the diversity of the student population and you know what, what is the focus on, on that? Well, um, we just got a great report in from our new director of admissions, Melody Mew, who's joined us from um, Lipo Chun United World College. That you know, we've we've got students from eighty five countries currently on campus in terms of reflecting in both the first and second year cohorts, uh, and you know the breakdown of, of of continents as well is pretty much in line with the past. So in terms of reassuring the community that you know our current student population does reflect the diversity of the past then we've got that and it's a data-driven piece um and yeah i think it's it's you know having um an admission strategy where we are committed 
to maintaining that balance. You know, it's part of the Pearson remit and the philosophy. It means that's what, you know, the, the director of admissions does. She, she, she maintains the healthy relationships with all of our national committees to ensure that we can meet all of those different quotas around diversity, gender. I mean, I would say the, the, the biggest challenge actually facing not just Pearson, but across the UWC movement, some of you may be aware of this, is the gender imbalance. There is increasingly in the last five to 10 years, uh, a drop off of applications from male students. So across the movement, it's 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 plus sixty percent plus in terms of um, female to male. I mean, um, I, I've got no idea what what the causal context is that across the movement, but that's something that people are beginning to be concerned about. I receive a number of emails from people across the movement about it, but it just seems to be a trend. Um, but in terms of maintaining the diversity from both country and continent, um, that's very much still in place and. Um, um, yeah, I can talk to that in as we do the transition into the AGM because I've got a few stories connected to that. Thanks so much, Craig. So I see we're we're closing in on our hour here. I want to make sure we have time to answer. There was a question in the in the chat from Gimile. I hope I pronounced that right. And I know Benoit is gonna gonna answer that. Pedro, I know you have your hand up again for a question about the board. I'm not sure if we'll have time to go to Lori, but let's Benoit go ahead first with this question. Gimile from Turkey's question is about um, uh, taking advantage of the fact that we have so many experts in all areas um, to invite them to be speakers at the college, uh, on, whether online or, or, or in person. And we've been doing a lot of that. And in fact, we've also been inviting alum to be part of working committees. Just uh, mentioned by uh, Craig, the DEI working committee we've just set up, we have uh, three new alum, one who's uh, deputy uh, director in the Ontario uh, Ministry for Anti-Racism, uh, Nosa Aero Brown from, from Nigeria. We also have a program called, uh, that's alumni led that we support, we've been supporting for almost a year uh, on Saturdays uh, called the Global Village Speaker Series, originated by Laurie Houston in year three and managed brilliantly together with um, um, Karen Robbins, also an alumna. And they've had more than 75% uh, of their sessions have uh, be speakers from all uh, ages, from all colleges, in fact, but mostly from Pearson College. So there's a lot of opportunities now that are generated through the possibilities of technology to have our own alum be the experts speaking. And um, so please, when if you wish to participate in these events, call on us. We're building lists of expertise in our um, priority areas, and we're calling on our alum. And the very next opportunity is the 23rd, where uh, Corey Bradshaw, year 14, a global ecology professor, is going to be presenting for global affairs, the, the monthly session that all our students follow, and it'll be beamed also around the world for all our alum to listen to. Thank you so much, Benoit. I've been given the green light from Annalisa to take a couple more minutes. So Pedro, um, let's see, I saw your question in the chat. Do you wanna ask it out? I can. It was just I saw I saw that Laurie Sterling is here. I don't know if any of the uh, any of the other board members are present. It'd be great to meet them and maybe get a quick uh, introduction or update and see what their focus is on uh, at this time. Maybe if it's appropriate. Thanks, Pedro. Laurie, <laughs> putting you on the spot. I haven't seen any other board members on the call yet. OK, well, uh, look, um, uh, we basically, as a board, as you know, Pedro, uh, are, are not so much involved in the day-to-day -day running, and we have a very capable Pearson team, as exemplified by the people on the call, uh, led by Craig. Um, so our job is basically uh, to um, uh, help set the strategic direction, uh, and, uh, you know, we hope Craig stays forever, but you know, as a secondary down the road at some point, uh, there will be some succession issues. Uh, but um, so really what you're seeing today is the fruits of our labor uh, insofar as uh, we support the Pearson team and we help to shape the priorities of climate change, sustainability, reconciliation, 
a focus on DEI, um, uh, and of course, uh, engagement of the alumni. You have to appreciate uh, that the board is highly supportive of further engagement with alumni. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks to all of you, uh, self-starters on this, plus the work of Benoit and his team uh, to support you. Uh, I, I think it's fabulous what's going on right now uh, in this minute and um, hope there are, you know, many more kinds of events like this. Uh, you know, people form very strong bonds when they're at the school and uh, we want to make sure that they're lifelong bonds. Uh, so, I think uh, I'm not saying anything new that you haven't heard today. I'm just saying to you that the board is on top of all these things. And is it true that there are eight alums on the board out of 12? Do, yeah. Can you tell us who they are? Yeah, I'm actually the vice chair now. And uh, uh, in, in addition. Congratulations, Laurie. That's great. Uh, uh, so uh, there are, what we're trying to make sure right now is that uh, there's a wide range of age groups uh, of alum that obviously bring skills. It's, it's basically a skill set board, right? Uh, that is our first priority along with diversity. And we are becoming definitely more diverse uh, and we'll keep working at that. Uh, but we're also trying to ensure we have some younger uh, alum on the board. So uh, Yawanda Ua uh, joined the board this year. Um, and uh, Owen Teo joined the board uh, and Anita George. Uh, so um, there are there are lots of alum and um, but there's also external perspectives. And uh, I think the mix is the right way to go. Lori, what year are you and where are you from? Uh, hi, everybody. I should have started that way. Uh, my name is Laurie Sterling, and I'm a year two alum. And I come from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I've been on the board for, uh, ooh, I want to say four or five years now. Uh, and um, I, um, I, I brought a skill set of governance, uh, having been a deputy minister of Indigenous Affairs, uh, in Ontario, uh, an Associate Deputy Minister of Justice for the federal government and the Deputy Minister of Labor and Skills Training. So that's who I am and nice to meet all of you. Thanks and what thanks for all your help. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lori. What a great question, Pedro. Thanks for allowing us for that opportunity. And thank you all for being here today. It's been wonderful to see. We've exceeded the 100 capacity, so I'm glad we got that sorted out. Great to see so many of you and have this chance to reconnect. So if you have a question that didn't get answered or you didn't feel comfortable putting it up, uh, we'll make sure that you have our contact information. I believe it's all on the website, but certainly we'll make sure you have that reach out anytime or there's many opportunities to engage and we're always happy to hear from you. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Annalisa and Ed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, thank you so much, Craig, Benoit, Theron, Brian, for this very illuminating and inspiring presentation and conversation. And hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation for how we can stay engaged and stay inspired and connecting and reconnecting with Pearson College as we go forth in this uh, inaugural alum reunion fest. Um, you know, thanks for bringing us closer to Pearson College with this conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. Yeah, I would uh, echo that. I think we're all very thankful for the work that uh, everyone at the college does. Um, and I think there's definitely something to be said about, uh, you know, everyone here is hopeful that we can keep having events like this, that we can keep participating actively with the college and that we can keep uh, all of us pursuing the, the UWC mission. 